throughout the course of this, I'll talk about kind of the daily rituals and routines, as well as the, the general lifestyles and traditions of those who made their living um, fishing on the, on the offshore banks. Um, I'll note that my research has focused predominantly on Lunenburg County and Lunenburg County fishing crews, but much of the information I'm going to present um, could really be applicable to, the, to other parts of the province as well. So in a world of tall ships and fishing banks, vessels were places of hard and often grueling labor. Work was intensely physical, the weather was harsh, um, and dangerous seas required tire, um, tireless vigilance. For hardy crews, these ships were not only demanding workplaces, but they were also homes away from home for long periods of time at sea. Bunks and galley tables were among the only places of refuge. Uh, food, tobacco, musical instruments, games, um, and tall tales provided meager but welcome comfort and entertainment. And a way for, um, from home for weeks or months at a time, sailors became closely knit groups who relied heavily upon one another. Um, distinct um, traditions, uh, languages, and art forms emerged. And these really, they helped to define um, that kind of unique and, and vibrant lifestyle. And um, that, that's the sort of thing that I'm going to uh, get into a little bit here tonight. Unfortunately, though, um, the lived experiences of common workers and the intimate details of their everyday lives were often absent uh, from official records. Um, you know, the meal times and, uh, and social interactions weren't really the, the type of thing that usually made their way into um, log books and journals. So instead, um, you know, specifics regarding the industry's social history and these aspects um, have to be distilled from alternate sources. Things like journals, um, oral histories, personal memoirs, um, obituaries, um, and, and the work of a select group of individuals uh, like Frederick William Wallace, who you see here, um, and Bill Bonyan. Um, and these were people who shipped aboard offshore vessels in order to capture critical details through photography um, and other documentary means. Um, uh, Frederick William Wallace, who you see here, he's, um, he was a renowned um, author and journalist who is, is known for books like um, Blue Water and Wooden Ships and Iron Men. Um, but he was also, um, and actually his photos have recently been, um, or somewhat recently been featured in a book called Camera on the Banks um, by Brooks Taylor. Um, but Bill Bonyan was also somebody who um, really became a, or sorry, not Bill Bonyan, Frederick William Wallace was somebody who really became kind of, um, intimately connected to the fisheries. Uh, he was a founding member of the Canadian Fisheries Association. Um, he was a, the uh, founder and editor chief, uh, editor in chief of um, Canadian Fisherman Journal. He was uh, an editor of the American Fishing Gazette. Um, so he was really kind of influential in, um, in trying to bring the voices of, of fishers to the general public. Um, so it's people like him, um, as well as uh, Bill Bonyan, who you see here carrying camera up the rigging, uh, old box camera up the rigging of um, the Arthur J. Lynn. Um, and th these people, you know, they helped to kind of bring these stories into the forefront as well. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. Um, Bill Bonyan here, he, he signed on to a, uh, um, onto the Arthur J. Lennier. He talked his way on as the Flunky's assistant, um, which is, uh, you know, the Flunky was the lowest ranking member of the crew, and, and I'll, get in, I'll get into that. But uh, he wanted to write a great memoir, a um, great book on the offshore fisheries, and he ended up throwing his, uh, his book into the fire. But, um, but his photos uh, were preserved, and they're at the Fisheries Museum now. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the research that I've been working on um, combines these types of sources um, and draws on the experiences of approximately 50 um, former fishermen. These men hail from ports across Lunenburg County, including the towns of Lunenburg, Mahone Bay, and Riverport, as well as places like Bruce's Island, Heckman's Island, the, the La Have Islands, Bayport, and Blue Rocks. Combine their stories, um, provide insight into the industry during the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. Now, the size and general makeup of a particular crew varied on a number of factors, um, you know, such as the size of the vessel and the type of fishery that was practiced. But most crews were made up of approximately 20 to 28 men, um, and, and uh, these included a captain and mate, a general fisherman, typically at least one, um, but sometimes as many as three young, young boys, as well as a cook and in later years an, engin an, an engineer. And they range in age from um, children to seniors. And it was actually not uncommon for multiple family members to work aboard the same vessel. Um, many boys got their start working for a family friend or going to sea with an older relative. And when I started digging into this research, that's something um, that I found particularly interesting. And, uh, um, you know, it's 
it's something I knew, I guess, from, from just living around Lunenburg. But I, I, in the past, I've done uh, um, a fair bit of research into the, the 18th century Massachusetts um, schooner fishery and the development of the schooner fishery down there. And um, in, in that um, region, it was actually, um, you know, it was common for people to avoid sending multiple family members on the same um, vessel because it was considered to be um, too great of a risk. Um, you know, you, you lose, um, you know, multiple people in, uh, from one household in one go. But um, in Lunenburg County, anyway, that was a risk that people were willing to accept. And for many, um, going to the sea was, was really less of a choice than an inevitability or an expectation. As Bayport's uh, Captain George Himmelman, um, who became a sort of a renowned captain around Lundberg, he once stated, quote, I went to sea because my brothers did, and they went to sea at quite a young age. I could see no other um, uh, way at the time, unquote. Um, most were the sons of sailors, um, and they grew up by the sea. Their fathers split their time between schooners and oxen, and their mothers worked tirelessly, keeping farms running and families fed and clothed. During childhood, um, they spent summer scurrying across the decks of portside vessels um, and earned pocket change, scrubbing schooners and hauling supplies. Forming, formal schooling typically came second, um, and their primary education was gained through experience. Many shipped out at a young age. A seafaring career typically began between um, the ages of 10 and 15, um, though it was not uncommon for boys to make their first trip before their ninth birthday. There were boys who went to sea um, to support their families. Um, their wages were generally quite meager, but um, for some, anything helped. Um, others were expected to follow in their father's footsteps and uh, their fathers themselves gone to, gone to sea at an early, uh, early age. And still some were, uh, were simply keen to grow up. They were, they were eager to, to seek adventure and this is one way to be able to convince their parents to let them go. Most young fishermen um, started as a flunky, and this was the lowest ranking member of the crew. They answered to everyone else on board. They cleaned the vessel, polished boots, perf uh, and performed countless unwanted tasks with no days off. Um, and this here, uh, these are this, uh, this set of oil skins, uh, um, it's actually, it's a, it's a set that's in our new exhibit. And I think it's probably one of the most impactful um, kind of gr artifact groupings that we have. Um, this, you don't get the full sense of it from, uh, of this sort of the size from the photograph, um, but these were made for, these were working oil skins made for an eight-year-old boy um, by his uh, grandmother in Oakport, Newfoundland, and um, they were made out of old flour sacks and linseed oil and painted black. And uh, you know, the, um, the, the broom, the birch broom that you see beside it is, um, you know, this, this is a very well-used broom, and that's the type of tool that, um, that, that these boys would have been using around the, around the vessels. Some more fortunate boys um, were given a job on the dressing gang, working as a header or a throater. Um, but these jobs generally came after a season or two as, as a flunky, and they too were, were really no easy task. Uh, once they got their feet under them, learned the ways of the sea, and grew a little stronger, boys inevitably, inevitably began fishing as ordinary seamen, um, kind of going out in a dory for the first time, and uh, many ultimately became full-fledged seamen. They learned the ways of uh, knot tying, gear rigging, net mending, rope splicing, um, and sail repair. Skills were learned through experience, um, and this, the young sailors were taught by the older generation, and they were expected to catch on quickly. Um, generally, you, you weren't shown um, how to do a task more than once. New boys were often um, harassed relentlessly by their fellow crew members, but you know this tended to be um, in good fun, and, uh, and generally speaking, fishing crews operated in a largely communal manner with everyone expected to work hard. The captain was the, uh, the undis undisputed um, authoritarian and, uh, and disciplinarian, though fishing um, vessels rarely contain the same kind of rigid authoritative hierarchy that's often associated with naval and merchant vessels. Um, for the most part on a fishing um, vessel, things were, were straightforward. If, if you didn't pull your weight, um, you simply weren't invited back for the next trip. When heading out on an offshore, um, Trip. Crew members were generally responsible for bringing, at minimum, their own bedding, clothing, and basic tools. Clothing usually included both handmade and store-bought items, and typically consisted of a pair of good boots, an oilskin outer layer, a few sets of old work clothes, an underlayer, mittens, and often a set of shore clothes uh, for return trips to port. The clothing, and particularly woolen wares, were often made at home, while the oilskins uh, were occasionally um, homemade, like like the ones that I that I showed you that were made for the uh, um, for the child, but these tended to be purchased um, 
through companies. In, in uh, Lunenburg County, we had Creasers and Bridgewater um, and Nosses and Riverport, both uh, firms that, that produced, uh, manufactured and sold um, oil skins. And they could also be purchased generally through um, the owners of the vessels that, uh, that who, and you know, these often ran company, these individuals often ran company stores. Under clothes, um, you know, generally were manufactured by companies like Stanfields or other uh, large woolen mills. Some men also owned um, kind of, you know, particular pieces like dickies for keeping their neck warms or chain bracelets um, to prevent shape, the shaping of oil gear. I'll, I'll show you a picture of those later on. Um, but these types of garments are something that would vary really from one person to the next. Um, alongside clothing and bedding, um, individuals were, um, may have carried things like letters, photographs, and other sentimental um, objects from home. They also um, took along books, instruments, um, tobacco, pipes, um, sometimes a bottle or two, um, and personal hygiene items such as razors. Though I will say personal hygiene does seem to have varied considerably from one account to the next. Uh, I've read reports that, that no one shaved and everyone returned home with big beards, um, and others that suggested that, that Sundays were days for shaving and cleaning. So it must have kind of depended on the individual and the specific vessel. Um, so clothing and other large personal items were carried aboard in chests and sea bags, like the ones you see in the photos here. While um, ditty boxes were used for small and important, um, small and important personal items and documents, and ditty bags called one's tools, and these were often transformed into um, really, really kind of spectacular pieces of art, often while at sea. And I just want to take an opportunity to show you some of the pieces, some of the, the ditty um, boxes and uh, and a bag that um, that are in our new exhibit. Um, and I, I think these are are truly remarkable pieces. That to me, they are, um, you know. They're, they're everyday objects for holding one's good, but they also, they really speak to, to the individual and to their experiences um, and to, to their sort of their, their, their personal tastes and, and sometimes cultural traditions. So this here is a, uh, a box that I think is, um, personally, I think this is a, of national um, significance. It's a, it's a piece that was uh, um, on loan at the museum for decades and um, just this past December became a, a permanent um, uh, donation or permanent acquisition. Um, so this was made by uh, a general, a general gentleman by the name of Ephraim Heckman uh, from Heckman's Island in, in Lindbergh County. And uh, you, know, you can see he's got you know, um, paintings of, of vessels likely that he came across during his travels. Um, you know, he's show, showing the, the flags, there's nautical, the nautical imagery um, there's swirling swastikas on the side, which is a uh, um, often kind of associated with um, with early German um, kind of artifacts and, and folk art. Um, this is another piece here. If anybody's a uh, if there's a, a folk art enthusiast uh, like myself, you may recognize this piece from a, a few publications. But this is another Lunenburg County piece that um, kind of brings together both um, Germanic cultural um, um, images. I think that often show up like the hearts and diamonds as well as uh, as the nautical stars, um, and uh, and again just another another example of um, of a beautiful box that kind of combines these these skills um, and brings them into a uh, into a utilitarian um, vessel or utilitarian object, and uh, and again this is similarly this is a um, a ditty box that's been it's been monographed or ditty bag rather. So an individual's tools. Um, like their personal objects uh, were important possessions. And these were often initialed to identify um, the owner and, um, and some were chip carved, painted or otherwise decorated. And they can be, it could also be reflection or expressions and reflections of the owner's experiences, um, personal interests ta and tastes and, and cultural backgrounds. And I'll just show you a couple of, um, of tools from the, uh, from the exhibit that I think are, are also um, truly remarkable. These two I should note are not within it, but. Um, these, these are two examples of um, chip carved and, and inlaid um, needle cases. So these would have held sailor's needles. And uh, the one on the left is, um, is actually, it's one of the, the most ornate kind of examples known to have come out of Nova Scotia. Um, and similarly, you have um, these squid jig cases, which um, again became sort of Beautiful pieces of folk art, as well as utilitarian tools. So these would have held um, uh, would have held squid jigs and would have been used not for the, um, you know catching um, squid for the commercial fishery, fishery, but rather um, for bait. So in in, in periods of downtime, um, 
crews would often jig for, for squid if they were running. So they, they'd have an extra supply of bait. So the living spaces were typically located in the cabin um, at the back or stern of the vessel and uh, um, the forecastle up front by the bow. The cabin had a stove for heating the men and drying their clothes and it housed the captain's quarters and accommodations for the flunky, as well as bunks for several of the men. In vessels like the Tressy Connor, which is uh, um, our museum's flagship vessel, um, it was actually two to a bunk, which is, uh, is pretty remarkable, I think. Um, it, must have, uh, it must have got pretty tight in there from, from time to time. Um, and personal possessions were generally kept in, uh, in a chest that was, that was stored beside the bunk. Each man had his, uh, um, sorry, um, most of the men, however, slept in the forecastle, um, where there were rows of hardwood bunks surrounded by a large galley table. Um, each man had his own bunk and uh, oil skins and, and personal possessions could be kept within a small built-in locker. Most bunks also had a simple cloth curtain and this provided really the only semblance of privacy that one could expect aboard such a vessel. Um, bunks were fitted out with bedding brought from home and uh, personal items like photos, books, and, and smoking pipes could be, could be stored on small shelves that would be located in each bunk. The folks will also house the cooking area and the main stove, as well as shack lockers um, and other cupboards for storing pots and pans and enamel and earthenware dishes. There was a pantry um, and other storage for food provisions. And this was also a space in which tools and other um, implements could be stored. Living conditions aboard such vessels must have ranged from bad to worse. The cabin and, and the forecastle were located on either side of the fish hold, and that smell alone um, must have been bad enough, let alone the, the smells of, of salt, wet wool, and a dozen or more unbathed men. Um, to give you a sense of, of the smell, uh, <laughs> I've heard a story from, from Blue Rocks, uh, which if anybody's unfamiliar with Blue Rocks, it's about 10 minutes from Lunenburg. Um, and there was a, uh, a gentleman who, um, who fished out of, out of Lunenburg, um, li who lived in, in Blue Rocks. And when, uh, um, when his wife caught word that his, his schooner had arrived back in port, she'd keep an eye out on the horizon for, for his dory because he'd brought his dory back home. And when she'd see him coming in his dory, she'd run down to his fish shack um, and lay out a, uh, a set of clothes. And when he got out of the dory, he was expected to, to strip down and bathe um, in, the, uh, um, in the ocean and put on his fresh clothes. And then his sea clothes would be weighed down in a tidal pool for two weeks, um, after which point they were brought up to the house um, and boiled in a, in a large cauldron outside of the house. And only after that point um, were the clothes allowed back in the house. So you, you can get a sense of just uh, um, how, how they must have smelt. Um, and uh, I, I work with uh, a number of, of women who are um, um, married to now retired fishermen and they, they said, you, there's you can never get the smell of fish out of those out of clothes. Um, no matter no matter how long you might, you might try to boil them. Um, so the cabin and uh, particularly the, the forecastle would have been damp, dark, cr um, crowded, and always wet. Um, I know a man who uh, um, went out uh, actually um, sword fishing on a schooner. Um, this must have been in the the sixties, late fifties, early sixties. And it was his first trip, and he said he was shocked when he woke up in the middle of the night, soaked because uh, water was running down um, the inside of his bunk just from uh, um, cracks in, in the hull, and uh, um, you know, and just a, a rough, rough, well well used schooner. In later years, uh, vessels had some electricity, um, but previously all light was provided by oil lamps, candles, and uh, glass deck um, light prisms. So glass prisms that would be set into the deck. And, and cast the light down below. The spaces were filled generally with blue tobacco smoke, steam, and the smoke and grime um, from the oil and wood burning stove. They were also home to a variety of unwelcome visitors from rats um, to spiders and cockroaches. Fresh water was a premium and a rarity. Um, as water st stores grew older, they became um, green and stale. And uh, as the week progressed, they water both kind of depleted and became less and less inviting. Um, then of course, there's, uh, there's also the, the lack of bathroom facilities. Um, so within these, uh, these vessels, crews practiced a, a bucket and chuck it um, approach. And uh, 
And apparently if, if the water, if the weather was too bad, um, you just go on the deck and blame it on the dog. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, like many kitchens, um, during periods of, of downtime, these, uh, these galleys and the galley tables became both places um, to eat and to socialize. In an industry dominated by intense physical labor with long hours and little rest, it's not surprising that food held considerable importance. Um, and it was, it was one of the few comforts that could always be relied upon. And kind of notably, um, previous to um, getting into, into fisheries research, I did a fair bit of work on, um, on lumber camps and sawmills. And, um, and you see the same kind of trend within that industry where food um, held tremendous, a tremendous amount of importance and it actually, and importance and actually became sort of a, a bargaining chip, um, uh, a bargaining tool. You know, there, were, there was generally more work than there were laborers um, and you know, the quality of the food and the quality of the cook um, could become you know, a, a reason why you might choose you know, one place versus the other. Um, and I think that you know, we see some similar trends within the fisheries as well. Food stores typically consisted of basic staples um, like potatoes, uh, dried or pickled beans, flour, sugar, barrels of molasses and butter. Uh, cask with salted pork um, and or beef, as well as um, eggs, which were a precious commodity that was often uh, um, preserved in salt. In Lunenburg County, um, our schooners also carried barrels of sauerkraut, which of course is a, is a reflection of the area's um, German heritage. There was rarely any livestock carried aboard, um, but during the, salt fish during the salt fishery, the only fresh meat consumed was that which could be obtained during, during the trip. This typically consisted of of uh, a fish, as well as occasionally seabirds um, or other, other animals, which could be hunted for food or for bait. There's also ample evidence that fishing crews from around um, the Northeast stopped at known island, or, um, islands that housed birding colonies and, uh, and they gathered eggs from these colonies. Food stores were typically the responsibility of the vessel cook. Um, and this was an individual whose kind of sole responsibility was, was feeding the men. In my research, um, it seems that cooks were rarely formally trained, and many seem to have ended up in the position by happen happenstance. Um, it, um, Lunenburg's Lawrence Allen, who is uh, kind of a legendary figure um, around Lunenburg for being the, uh, an, an owner of the, uh, um, the Lunenburg Dory Shop and um, for spending time on the Blue Nose, um, was also a vessel cook. And, uh, and he spent over 30 years um, working as a cook aboard multiple vessels. And, and had no form or formal training at all. He began working when he was asked to prepare meals, or cooking when he was asked to prepare meals um, on a short voyage upon his uncle's um, vessel. And he just, he just took to it and spent many years in the profession. Um, and he noted that, that he preferred the safety and security um, of you know, being a cook working on the schooner um, rather than heading out and, and facing the dangers of, of working in a small dory out on the banks. While some cooks certainly had recipes, um, Lawrence Allen explained uh, in an oral history interview that we have that he never used a recipe and instead had a natural gift of being able to eat a meal, um, be it a, a cake or pie or, or a full uh, elaborate sort of Sunday meal. And, um, and he could then replicate that meal, which is a skill I certainly wish I had. Um, but recipe or not, vessel cooks were required to, to whip up um, a basic set of provisions into meals that, were, that could satisfy the harshest of critics. Cooks were incredibly important crew members um, who likely faced a considerable amount of critique. Though in my research, uh, I've only found one instance of a cook who was found unsatisfactory um, by the crew. And this was actually due to, um, to kind of lack of cleanliness rather than um, you know, being a poor cook. But uh, like a lazy fisherman, he was just promptly replaced at the next port of call. Breakfast commonly included um, hash and beans, fried potatoes, sausages, hot biscuits, bread, coffee, and tea. Soups were a main staple at any time, um, and known ves vessel recipe books contain entries for a wide assortment of elaborate meals. Tuesdays and Fridays were, general were generally fish days, at which time crews might expect the likes of fresh fillets or cod cheeks and tongues, maybe perhaps fried and salted pork. Um, on many vessels, the men could look forward to a Sunday roast, and the cook would actually soak the salt out of a large piece of salted beef and transform it into a, a fine Sunday dinner, complete with a cake or pie um, or some other sort of dessert. And, uh, you know, things like, co like cookies, um, rolls, cinnamon buns, and other pastries were really expected to be available pretty well anytime. At dinner time, a bell was rung and, uh, 
and this signaled that it was time for the captain, mate, and senior seamen to take their meals. Once they were finished, the bell was rung again, and the remainder of the crew um, could take their seat um, and eat what was left. When he was eating, the captain also said grace and always um, sat at the head of the table. Now, this was generally fine. Um, however, you know, the, the position at the head of the table was, um, was convenient because there was, a, uh, um, there, there was typically a, a hatch right above, a um, ladder going up. So if he needed to, uh, he, could, he could kind of run up the, or climb up the ladder and be on, on the deck in no time. But it's also where they, uh, where they kept the gurry bucket, um, kind of generally in that spot. And I know there's one story out of Lunenburg where a, um, a, a dory crew were actually all out at sea and it was just the, uh, the captain and the cook down in the forecastle, and the cook was eating his, his meal and, uh, or sorry, the captain was eating his meal. Um, and they, uh, they were hit by a rogue wave and the, the gurry bucket came flying down the, uh, the hatch, hit the, the, uh, the, um, the captain in the back of the head, gurry spewed, spewed all across the galley table. And, uh, when he came back into port, the cook, the cook said that the captain cursed for 10 minutes straight and didn't repeat himself once. So it, uh, it must've been, uh, Quite, quite an experience, uh, <laughs> to say the least. So uh, um, generally, um, in addition to the uh, um, you know, to typical meals, um, fishermen frequently enjoyed a mug up, which was uh, basically just a, a hot cup of coffee or tea and a, a cookie or, or some other type of baked goods. And mug ups were something that happened frequently throughout the course of a day. Vessel cooks, like flunkies, worked every day. Um, they fed the crew no matter the, what the conditions were like. Um, as Lawrence Allen once uh, recalled, quote, sometimes you'd give a pitch and clean a uh, little stuff off the table, something like that, but you didn't mind it. You picked it up and started over again. Lots of time the soup would be going over the stove or juice out of the potatoes or something going over the stove, got the steam going up, but you didn't mind it, unquote. Nevertheless, when they did have a spare moment, cooks often helped out where they could, and uh, many of them provided much needed um, assistance to the boys. They, you know, they would help fork the fish and do other physically demanding jobs that were really, really hard for the kids to do. As anyone who's uh, had the task of feeding um, hungry mouths know, knows really the work never ends. And that was, that was the case on a, on a schooner as well. The fishery was a hard profession with long days that often led from one to the next. So downtime must have provided an important opportunity to catch up on rest and a rare chance to relax and socialize. While trips could last for months at a time, crews regularly made port calls, and uh, um, fishing crews ran, ra ran rampant in port cities like Halifax and St. John's. Men broke up their shore clothes um, and got ready for a time on the town. Uh, it was one Lunar fisherman, um, Captain Matthew Mitchell, recalled uh, in laughter, I will say, um, they often enjoyed going to, uh, to the theater, the theater, and they'd often, they'd often see uh, um, westerns. They, you know, they, they want nothing to do with... Uh, uh, movies about the sea because they knew that too well so they, they'd go see they'd go see the westerns and uh he said they they'd all get all get cleaned up put on their shore clothes um you know get get fancied up go to the theater and they still had at least two or three rows to themselves because nobody dared sit anywhere close to them um as i mentioned earlier uh um men often carried a bottle of alcohol in their personal possessions um and some vessels actually provided small a small rum ra um, ration but I found little evidence to suggest that drinking was prevalent at sea, especially when working. Um, and if anything, heavy drinking crews um, really kind of developed negative reputations, um, especially the captains. Um, and and they, were, they were generally criticized for endangering their men. When dockside, however, uh, things were much different. And many a man returned um, back, back, to, back home or back to the vessel with a black eye they couldn't account for or a new tattoo from one of the... Uh, <laughs> the big cities had two parlors, um, things like that. While at Portman also socialized with crews of other vessels um, and friends were welcomed aboard, especially uh, the captain's friends. Um, while off du um, duty, whether at port um, or at sea, time off was an opportunity to tell stories, share gossip, hold strength competitions, and play games. One game that was commonly played um, was a board game known as, uh, as Fox and Geese. And uh, um, this is uh, this, this is box and geese board here. Um, this is a this is a vessel board that was owned by a middle of hate captain, um, but a similar a similar one that's um, actually now part of the Smithsonian's collection was um, exhibited 
1891 Fisheries Exhibition in London in a display on, on fishermen's habits. And they note that it was a, actually a common game played on the offshore banks. While downtime was a, a chance to socialize, um, for others, it was an opportunity to, uh, to take time for oneself um, you know, and do things like read books um, and newspapers, maybe uh, um, read, read magazines, write in journals, write letters home, that sort of thing. And others um, took the opportunity to develop navigational skills, learn the tides, or otherwise develop skills that, um, in hopes that, that someday they may uh, become master of their own vessel. And uh, I'll just stop for a moment and, and point out in this photograph, you can see um, this gentleman's wearing the, the chains around his wrists that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so these would have been, been worn in order to um, prevent your oil gear from, from shaping one's skin. Music was also common, especially on Sundays. Um, the Sabbath was a traditional day off aboard all Lunenburg County vessels during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and most fishermen were prohibited from doing any work at all, even uh, jigging, jigging for squid for bait. Many vessels carried Bibles and hymn books were, uh, were common um, for the captain. To, uh, or, sorry, many uh, vessels carried Bibles and hymn books and it was common um, for the captain to hold service. And this could be followed by the singing of hymns, um, which was often accompanied by a violin or an accordion. Um, and this, this violin here is actually, uh, it's a pretty, um, Pretty significant new acquisition for our, our museum as well. Um, it's um, it's a piece that just entered our collection within the, within the past few months, and it was a it's a William Godley violin made in Lunenburg in 1901, but it was um, played by a uh, um, out at sea um, by a captain for his crews while while he play hymns for them on Sundays. Um, and uh, actually, notably, there's certain vessels such as the schooner Harrietta that had so many good singers aboard them that they, they actually developed reputations for the quality um, of their Sunday sessions, which I think is something that's, that's pretty neat. Periods of rest also provided opportunities for creativity um, and personal reflection. Some um, particularly creative mariners use this time to craft decorative um, objects, um, you know, generally pieces that were, that were made um, out of readily available materials. And while some were utilitarian in nature, things like the tools and, and uh, ditty boxes, many were made as gifts for loved ones back home, or they were um, they're pieces that depicted um, experiences um, at sea and, and other kinds of life events. And just to show you a few examples, um, this here is a uh, sailor carved um, busk, likely dating to the, the first half of the 19th century. Um, and so this would have actually this is it's displayed wrong, and then this photo it would have stood upright with the scalloped bit at top. So th this is something that would have uh, would have been used to would have slid into the front pocket um, or front pouch of a woman's corset. Um, and uh, um, you know, they were often made um, at sea in you know Massachusetts and and down in um, in the states. Um, most of them were made of whale um, baleen. Um, the ones I've seen from Lunenburg County are typically uh, sort of exotic hardwoods. Um, but these are something that they were, they were gifts made by sailors for their sweethearts. Um, but I think they were really objects for the men, not for their loved ones. You can imagine how deeply uncomfortable it must have been to, to wear one of these. Um, however, it was the, uh, um, the closest that you could really get to a woman's naked body. So, um, you know, I, I've heard kind of others speculate that this actually, these may have been as much of an opportunity for lonely sailors to uh, let their minds wander while at sea um, as they were, you know, really true gifts for, for, for their loved ones. Um, now these here, um, these actually were, were made on a, uh, not on a fishing uh, voyage, rather a, uh, um, a mercantile uh, um, a voyage, but the mini, tiny little miniature Sue's would have been brought home as a as a gift. Um, and this is a this is a piece that I I truly love. Um, another fairly new acquisition for us. Um, this needle hitch bottle was made by Captain George Myra, who I guess would have been most famous for sort of uh, or most well known for for saving the 1938 um, um, international fishermen's race um, for blue nose when. When the when the uh, the rigging started to go up in the top mast, he climbed aboard and and uh, and and basically, in a very daring um, 
kind of maneuver uh, got everything back together and and, uh, and saved the race. But the um, the, the um, bottle here was made at a you know on, a, on another voyage uh, um, for his sister. And uh, um, if you see a little note that's tied to the inside of the cork, it just says "shipwrecked on the Irish coast." Guess who? Um, and uh, <laughs> I thought that was that's pretty neat. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably the uh, the Irish coast of, of Newfoundland or what would kind of consider the Irish coast. And uh, yeah, so these are the types of objects that, um, that would have been brought home um, for loved ones. Um, and homecoming was, of course, a, a really, truly, um, you know, it was, a, it was a time for celebration when the voyage was over. But it also, for many, just represented um, the beginning of the next stage of, of the, the season, the next stage of um, sort of one's working life.